So um, today's lecture is about the limbic system, and this is a, kind of a, a changing set of brain structures. Uh, sometimes things get added and, and, and removed over the years, so it's still evolving. What's actually in the limbic system? Um, the limbic system is going to be involved with homeostasis, olfaction, memory, and emotion. Home is how you can remember that, and that's because of the brain structures that are in it. We got our hypothalamus for homeostasis. Uh, we'll start off today's lecture with the olfactory circuits, just to breeze through those pretty quickly. But there's a direct projection from your olfactory bulbs to the limbic cortices. So down there in the uh, anterior, inferior temporal lobes. We'll then go through the thalamus and reach the orbitofrontal cortex to create our perception of smell. But before then, before we hit the thalamus, we actually hit the cortex first. So smell is the exception to all roads having to go through the thalamus. Memory and emotion are going to be the second and third parts of this. So homeostasis we covered already. Lecture 12. Yeah. I'm sure you remember. Um, speaking of remembering, that's going to be the second part of this. And for memory, we're largely going to be thinking of the hippocampus. Uh, because the memory that we're talking about here would be explicit memories. Um, dealing with facts, autobiographical events, things like that. Not muscle memory. Muscle memory is, of course, in the cerebellum. Still memory, but you can't really tell people about it. Play an instrument, you can't just say, well, here's how you do it. Just play all the red notes. That's not very helpful. Uh, and the emotion part of the limbic system is incredibly complicated. We're going to get to that in the third part of it. And we'll see if we can draw some simple circuits to link together our nucleus accumbens, amygdala, anterior cingulate cortex, and the VTA. Another source of dopamine here. VTA is very close to the substantia nigra, but rather than just targeting the dorsal striatum largely, the VTA is going to hit your cortex, it's going to hit other limbic structures like the hippocampus and the nucleus accumbens. That'll be the third part. We're going to start off with olfaction. Uh, before we do that, let's, let's take a moment to appreciate just how beautiful this is. What are we looking at here? Any idea? There are some colored dots, that's true. Each of those dots is a neuron. So this is uh, from what we call a rainbow mouse, uh, because the brain has kind of a rainbow of colors in it. Um, it's, it's through um, random splicing of fluorescent proteins, well, the promoters anyway. So you get all these different colors. So each one of those different colors is, a, is an individual neuron. What we're looking at here is the hippocampus. You can see three layers here. Here's your cell layer here where all your cell bodies are located for the most part. There's a few stragglers here and there. The plexiform layer and a molecular layer right there. Just three layers. When we talk about the cerebral cortex, you see that this is very different. The cerebral cortex has six layers, this one only has three. So it's a little more ancient. We have the same structure in our olfactory bulbs as well, which is one of the reasons that they're lumped together with the limbic system. There's also that direct projection into limbic cortices. Um, olfaction is going to be uh, carried out by the shortest cranial nerve. Uh, cranial nerve one is an unmyelinated nerve that passes from your uh, olfactory epithelium here into the olfactory bulb. That's it. It just pierces that interperform plate there. That's it. There's your first cranial nerve. Then we're going to hit the olfactory bulbs and head back into the uh, uh, anterior inferior temporal lobes. So the sensory neurons are called olfactory sensory neurons, not surprisingly. So they're going to detect uh, odorants that are dissolved in the mucous membrane in your olfactory epithelium. You might notice here that these are bipolar cells. They have their dendrites hanging down here into the air, into the mucus, I suppose. And their axons head on up into these glomeruli. More on those in a bit. Because of this location, because they're dangling their dendrites down here and exposing themselves to odorants, in other words, to air, uh, they're fragile and they die. 
they die pretty frequently. So this is one of the locations where we see adult neurogenesis. We have to replace these neurons. So we have some stem cells hanging around to replenish these dead olfactory neurons. Um, olfactory neurons are going to continue to die, and our stem cell population is going to drop as we age, so our sense of smell is going to worsen uh, as we get older. Because these neurons will continue to die, and if we don't replace them, well, we don't pick up odorants here and transfer that on up into the olfactory bulbs. The way that we detect odorants is with metabotropic receptors. So the uh, odorant receptors, we have uh, about a thousand different genes or so in that family. Each of them is going to bind one or a handful of different molecules. They have a little binding site, and when the molecule binds, that turns on the receptor and it stimulates a GS alpha protein. They call it GOLF here for G O L F, uh, since it's you know, the whole faction, but it's still GS. So you can pick the cutesy name if you want, but just keep in mind it's GS. Same thing. Increase the KMP, depolarize the cell. Then we're going to stimulate our secondary afferents here, the mitral cells. Those are going to project from our olfactory bulbs back into the cortex. Also going to make another loop back. The place where they hit up or they meet one another is the glomeruli. We have about 2,000 of these, and these are little collections where all of the olfactory sensory neurons that detect the same odorant meet up. So in your olfactory epithelium, these neurons are going to be scattered around but somehow, their axons meet up and converge in one or two glomeruli. All of the axons within that one glomerulus, here it is in the olfactory bulbs right here. Here's a zoom in. Here's a little zoomed out. What we're looking at here, here's the olfactory epithelium. So when the mouse takes a nice inhalation there, air flows in. The odorants are going to hit the dendrites here. <clears throat> those sensory neurons project into the olfactory bulb and they all converge in the same spot. It's still kind of a mystery how this works. But somehow they're able to find each other. In the uh, glomeruli we don't see really any cell bodies other than some glia. These are collections of axons from our sensory neurons and dendrites from the secondary afferents. So in each glomerulus it's one single over receptor. They converge there. Uh, not surprisingly, we're going to see lateral inhibition here, just like we see everywhere else in the nervous system. So when we have excitation of different sensory neurons, that's going to create some chaotic pattern here that makes a little more sense in the olfactory bulge because of that convergence. We get focal areas of activity. So we're trying to distinguish the pattern here so we have a cleaner pattern up here where the magic happens, and that's through lateral inhibition. So there are neurons called periglomerular cells that are going to inhibit nearby glomeruli. So when we have activity here, the neighbors are going to be inhibited. So that activity will stimulate this periglomerular cell, and it inhibits all nearby glomeruli. So only those that are strongly excited are going to stimulate their secondary afferents, and all the others will be inhibited. So we're trying to cut down noise. It's the same thing we've seen everywhere else with lateral inhibition. We have another site of lateral inhibition, and that's going to be the granule cells here. These are kind of uh, unique because they don't really have axons. It's all dendrites, so they're dendrodendritic synapses uh, for what that's worth to you. The mitral cells, <laughs> when they are stimulated, they stimulate the granule cell, and that causes lateral inhibition, so only the strongly stimulated mitral cells are going to communicate with their targets. So we have two sites of lateral inhibition so we can create a cleaner signal, a, a cleaner pattern of activity, so we can better distinguish odorants. <coughs> Once activated, mitral cells then project on down the olfactory bulbs here. So there's the olfactory bulb, then they create the olfactory tract. There's going to be a little medial offshoot that actually goes back and stimulates those granule cells to inhibit the other side. This, in theory, should allow us to detect the direction of smell. I've never really been able to do that. I think this might only apply to dogs. Um, but that's the idea of how true that is. Uh, I'm not sure. Hold on.
That's going to be right. In addition to that medial offshoot, uh, there's, there's a lateral tract here. And here is where we're going to hit our limbic system. So we're going to be hitting the inferior, so on the bottom, medial anterior temporal lobe. So we're looking at the bottom of the brain here. Here's our midbrain. We got our mammillary bodies there. This is the uh, stalk that's going to lead up to the pituitary. So here's our hypothalamus, midbrain. Just beside that, here's our temporal lobe. We're looking at the bottom of them on the medial portion. That's where you get into your limbic system, the medial temporal lobes. Damage there is going to cause severe problems with memory. In this case, it can also cause problems with olfaction as well. So here's our tertiary afferents. And at this point, we're in the cortex. And notice we haven't gone through the thalamus. We go from the olfactory epithelium into the olfactory bulbs, down the olfactory tract, and into our uh, piriform lobe, in this case. So the inferior, anterior, and medial temporal lobes. So here's our tertiary afferents here. And the structures that we find here, I mean, a couple that should be uh, uh, familiar to you. So there's the amygdala. So here's where we can start to create some emotional response to smell immediately. And there's the parahippocampal gyrus, right down in there. This is the cortex that's very close to the hippocampus. So the, the parahippocampal gyrus goes through the entorhinal cortex, then to the hippocampus. So it's very closely linked to memory circuits. And this is again why uh, smells can elicit memories so strongly. You might have some familiar smells, and when you smell them, they're going to they're conjure up those memories. And that's because we have fairly direct connections to memory and emotion circuits. We'll then hit the dorsomedial thalamus, head on over to the orbital frontal cortex, and then we have our conscious perception of that smell. But before that occurs, or probably around the same time that that occurs, we're already having an emotional response and conjuring up some memories of that smell. Maybe it's some fresh baked cookies or something like that, of course, with extra salt, and sugar. <laughs> Those smells can also then create some <coughs> autonomic responses. Maybe you've had these too. Speaking of cookies, maybe you salivate when you smell the cookies. Mm, aren't they nice? That autonomic response is because of that smell. That, that chocolate chip cookie pattern that you created there is going to stimulate via your medial forebrain bundle neurons in the hypothalamus and brainstem so that we have an autonomic response. We salivate. Or hell, maybe we rich. Maybe it's not a good smell. Maybe ooh. Maybe it's used chocolate chip cookies. I don't know. But you can have an autonomic response to smells. You've probably experienced this before. Um, one of the thoughts of uh, uh, because of this link between uh, smell and, and memory and emotion, is that we can use aromatherapy, um, where you have certain smells that you'll you'll send around in the room, and that's going to help, uh, for example, control blood pressure or something like that. So rather than taking uh, a beta blocker, you can just smell lavender. That's the idea. Um, and I don't know, maybe it's true. So that's what they did in this case. They had folks smell lavender. I think this was with uh, some Korean school teachers or something like that. And they took their blood pressure and heart rate before and after relaxing and smelling lavender. Maybe it's the relaxation, maybe it's the lavender, really hard to say. <laughs> um, could be that. If you look at um, other trials, though, that actually control for that relaxation, and have a placebo control, which that one didn't. Uh, you see it's basically the same. The actual effect on feelings of anxiety, the, the effect on heart rate and blood pressure, 
basically the same if you include placebo. If you don't include the placebo, yeah, placebo is wonderful. So you could also just relax. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with smelling lavender. It smells nice. It smells much better than used chocolate chip cookies. Any questions? Is that only for lavender? Is that for like... <laughs> Clearly it, it works for nothing too. Uh, so mineral oil doesn't have the smell. I just happened to pull two with lavender to show you if you don't have a placebo control. Uh, isn't that a nice picture? It looks wonderful. But if you have a placebo control, then you realize you're just looking at a placebo effect. This, I just took the same smell. These exist for other smells too. I think they use bergamot and rose, all kinds of things. Yeah. But it's probably just placebo. But the, the theory behind it is because of these direct connections between olfaction and your emotion <coughs> and then your uh, autonomic response, maybe we could alter autonomic responses by altering what we're smelling. Maybe not. Yeah. Okay. Let's run through these. When we're talking memory, semantic memories, so facts, or, or autobiographical memories, we're thinking hippocampus. That's what needs to come to mind. This structure is absolutely critical the formation of explicit memories. So all the facts that you're learning, you should thank your hippocampus for that. And yourselves. It's hard work, and you're putting it in there. But it's through repetitive activation of hippocampal circuits that you store information. Memorization and remembering are the exact same thing. Don't try to belittle remembering by calling it memorization and putting some stink on the syllables. It's the same shit. There is no difference. It's all going to involve changing the circuits in your hippocampus. There is no difference. In the more anterior portions of our parahippocampal gyrus, here's where we're going to have our connections with the hippocampus here. The hippocampus is going to kind of peel back and head upward. So in that anterior portion, we're going to have reciprocal connections between our hippocampus, here it is, Colored kind of blue here, except for the dentate. And it's a big one. Back and forth connections between our hippocampal complex and the cortex here. Now the direct input and output here is going to be the intrarhinal cortex. This also has bidirectional connections with association cortices. So that part, the parts of the cortex that are putting together multiple senses to create a little more elaborate understanding of what's going on right now, rather than just the fine details. So the actual perceptions of form, shape, what objects are, that type of information gets sent to the interrhinal cortex and then relayed through the hippocampus. The hippocampus is a very excitable region. It's often a source of epileptiform activity. <clears throat> we'll get to that in, in, in a bit. But those neurons, because they're so excitable, it makes them uh, easy. It, it, uh, it allows them to rearrange their synapses. The way that they do that is with long-term potentiation. We'll get to that in a bit. But that's how we make memories. And when we're talking memory, really there's, there's two things that we should be thinking about for memory. There, there's the initial encoding of the memory. And that's taking that pattern of activity in the cortex, that primary perception of when it's going on now, and transferring it into the hippocampus so that later on you can remember, what did that guy say? When I'm saying it, your cortex perceives it and you can store it for a little bit. By a little bit, I mean minutes to years in the hippocampus. Yeah, it's kind of arranged. And depending on how important it is to you, that depends on how quickly we then consolidate it. And consolidation is taking that pattern that we created here in this highly excitable and plastic area and transferring it back into the cortex. And that's when the memory is stable. <clears throat> your name is a pretty stable piece of information. You probably know your name pretty well. It's not stored in your hippocampus anymore. It's up in the cortex. Anything that you can remember for a long time is gonna be stored in the cortex. The junk that you're holding on to for the purposes of getting through a class, that's probably just staying in the hippocampus, I'm sorry to say. 
all that chemistry you learned. That had stuck around the hippocampus for a little bit, and it's gone. <laughs> There's inklings of it, though. You can relearn it um, easier than you can learn it the first time. So the way that, that, that I like to think of memory is, you know, it starts in the cortex, right? You create your perceptions. Here's your day at the beach. So, so this top part here, this is just saying that even with only 32 neurons, <coughs> They can encode uh, over 4.2 billion different patterns, just with 32 neurons. They're either on or they're off. They're firing or they're not. They're binary, just like little computational units in computers. Bits, ones and zeros, right? The one is the actual potential, the zero is silence. And with just 32 neurons, you can create 4.2 billion patterns. We have more than 32 neurons in our head, so we can create an infinite number of patterns. Your day at the beach, you're going to have some somatosensory input, how the sand feels, you're going to hear some things, you're going to see some things. Different parts of the cortex have these different patterns of activity when you first perceive them. That gets passed to the interrhinal cortex, then into the hippocampus, and sore for some time. And when you recall your day at the beach, what the hippocampus is doing is trying to recreate those patterns in the cortex. And if you study something enough, or if you think about it enough, you consolidate those memories where they're no longer dependent on the hippocampus. What you're doing is stimulating those neurons in the cortex, and when they're activated at the same time, neurons that fire together, wire together. So now, without the hippocampus, you can recall your day at the beach if it was that special to you, that you think of it years down the road. What we're doing is quickly rewiring the hippocampus and then slowly rewiring the cortex. There are a few different routes through the hippocampus. Just to keep in mind, uh, it's, it's not just a simple one-way circuit. There's a few routes. You can go directly into the dentate gyrus. Here's your perforant path. There's also an alveolar path that's going to go around and, and hit, uh, oops, hit, the, uh, hit the CA there. So here's our areas. Dentate gyrus. There's your main input. Then there's this horn-like structure that kind of bends around. It's called uh, CA or cornu ammonis annus horn. Whatever that means, I don't know. I think it's some uh, mythology crap. Uh, CA one, two, three, four. No, one, two, three, four. Doesn't matter. This is your relay. So we hit the dentate gyrus usually. Then we go through. CA, then we hit the subiculum. So it's usually a trisynaptic circuit. First synapse, somewhere in the dentate gyrus. Second, somewhere in this bend. Third one, in the subiculum. And there's your output. This is a pretty solid rule. The subiculum is the output. We sometimes bypass the dentate gyrus. So this is usually true, but not always, because there's a couple different paths. Like I said, there's your perforant path that's going to go from the interrhinal cortex to the dentate gyrus. There's another pathway, though, that's going to go from the interrhinal cortex straight into cornuomanus here, straight into the horn. So we bypass the dentate gyrus. I have no idea what the functional significance of that is, but it exists. So there are two pathways into the hippocampus. I don't know of any functional difference between them. They're both involved in memory. From CA, we're going to the subiculum. From the subiculum, we're going back to the anorhinal cortex. So it's a big loop. It's a way for the anorhinal cortex to ask the hippocampus, what do I remember about this? What pattern have I stored? When I ask you about what happens when you have an increase in intracellular calcium, you pass that through the hippocampus. That pattern of me asking about elevated intracellular calcium stimulates uh, mitochondrial permeabilization in cell death. And that's where you're storing it for now. And then in a couple of years, it'll be gone. I know. Unless you think about it every day. If you remind yourself every day of that fact, it'll make it to the cortex. Boy, won't that be a treat. <laughs> so here's our back and forth from interrhinal cortex, which is, again, uh, connected with the areas of the cortex that have some idea of what's going on out there in the world. They create perceptions. So when you try to remember, what did grandma's face look like? Uh, you can try to create that <coughs> perception again kind of weakly by stimulating the cortex, and it's tough. There's a lot more neurons in the cortex than in the hippocampus. So it's bit reduction. The, the, the cortex is more like vinyl, and the hippocampus is like a low bit rate MP3. Doesn't sound as good. 
there's another circuit that's going to hit other parts of the limbic structures too. It's the Papez circuit. This is going to link together, again, interrhinal cortex and hippocampus. No surprise there. From the hippocampus, we can go back to the interrhinal cortex, or we can head on around via the fornix to the mammillary bodies. This is what causes memory dysfunction when we have damage to the mammillary bodies, because they're linked to the hippocampus. This is also important for memory formation, but this is going to allow us to then hit the thalamus and then the cingulate cortex. And now we're in the cortex. This is going to be connected with other areas as well. This is yet another loop that's going to link your hippocampus with the cortex. And it explains why damage to your diencephalon, thalamus, hypothalamus, can cause memory problems. Because it disturbs one of the pathways through which the hippocampus affects the cortex. So the ability to conjure up those memories is impaired. So you could damage the hippocampus, or you could damage anywhere along this circuit and get severe memory problems. There's a few ways of getting into the hippocampus. Both of these possibilities are involved in memory function. The Papez circuit is just going to allow us to recruit some other structures as well. So it's a secondary pathway. In life, we generally don't just have one way of doing things, because if that one way breaks, well, you're screwed. So we usually have a couple different pathways. So here's a couple options of how to get from cortex to hippocampus and back. And the reason that we involve the hippocampus is because it's so plastic. It can change the strength of its synapses based on activity, based on learning. And here's the data that show this most directly, I think. What they've done in this experiment is implant multiple electrodes in the hippocampus. So here's our hippocampus. We've got our dentate gyrus down here. Here's our Ammon's horn head to the subiculum over here. So they implanted these eight different recording electrodes to just record what's the general activity of hippocampal neurons. And they have a stimulating electrode. So they can stimulate the axons running here to see how strong are the synapses. So they're just going to monitor synapse strength by stimulating here and recording there over time while the rats learn or don't. We have rats that don't learn too. So here's our conditions. Because you, you want to make sure that you have your, your control. Right? If you just smell lavender oil and your blood pressure drops, well, was it the lavender oil? I don't know. So we have appropriate controls here. Naive means they didn't do anything. They implanted the electrodes and just let them live. Just run around your cage, do whatever you do. The learning paradigm here was to put the rats into a novel cage and shock them. Pain is very uh, instructive. And uh, it, it's one of the, the fastest ways to elicit learning. And rats quickly learn, this cage sucks. I don't like this cage. I get shocked when I'm in here. Some, they don't uh, take them to a new cage or anything like that. They just shock them. If you shock them, does it change their hippocampus? Not really. They have nothing to learn. Shocks suck. There's no novelty to try to learn and associate with that shock. Others, they just put them in a new cage. Let them walk around. Not a whole lot going on compared to those who were put into a novel context, so a new cage, and shocked. This new place sucks. They had something to learn, and they learned it. They learned to avoid the parts of the cage that shocked them. So those that learned, you'll notice here, very different colors than down here. The colors are showing you the, the change in synapse strength. The redder it is, the stronger the synapses got. Here's the individual recording from the eight different electrodes. They each have their own color there. You can see some of them went up, some of them went down. That's important. Learning involves increasing and decreasing synapse strength as well. Because sometimes you got to unlearn the incorrect stuff. So in this learning task, we can see that there's a change in the strength of synapses in the hippocampus. That's what it's all about. That's what learning is. Create a new pattern in your hippocampus. So when some new information is presented to you, you know what it means. You know what it means if there's an increase in intracellular calcium levels now. And that's because you've modified your hippocampus. Again, if you study it, it'll make it to the cortex, and if you don't, you'll forget. That change in synapse strength has everything to do with NMDA receptors, for the most part. Do we remember NMDA receptors? Good. These are ionotropic glutamate receptors, but they're more than just that. They're also voltage-dependent. 
Hopefully you recall they have that magnesium block. So that at rest, if neurons haven't been stimulated, NMDA receptors don't get activated. It's only going to be AMPO. NMDA receptors are only activated when the neurons are active both pre- and postsynaptically. That postsynaptic neuron has to first be depolarized. Now here's why we think NMDA receptors are so important for learning. This, believe it or not, is learning. Um, this is learning in a slice, so they took the brain out and sliced it. Obviously, you can't really measure learning in that case. But what we're looking at is that increase in synapse strength. Here's baseline. And then they stimulate strongly the hippocampus and see that the synapses are now stronger. And the reason that occurred is because pre- and postsynaptic neurons were firing action potentials at the same time. Those that fire together, wire together. And the reason that they're wiring together is because of NMDA receptor activation. When you block NMDA receptors with AP5, or this NDP down here, both of these are NMDA receptor antagonists. In the presence of those drugs, you'll notice we quickly return to baseline. There's a very short-term change, and then nothing. We don't have this long-term increase in synapse strength like we did in the absence of those antagonists. So when you block activation of the NMDA receptor, no change in synapse strength. No learning. Same thing is true if you look at learning paradigms and you infuse NMDA receptor antagonists in the rodent. No learning. That's because they can't rearrange their hippocampal <coughs> circuits. What we think that NMDA receptors are doing when we have our neurons firing together and we relieve that voltage block, that magnesium block there, when we spit out glutamate, we get strong calcium influx. Remember, NMDA receptors are going to uh, slowly desensitize, unlike NMDA receptors. So we get a bunch of calcium coming in. Calcium is a secondary messenger. It's going to activate kinases. These kinases are going to increase the abundance of NMDA receptors, I'm sorry, of AMPA receptors. So my AMPA, I've colored red here, and NMDA is, is green. At rest, we got a magnesium block. So if this neuron isn't active while this one is, all we get is AMPA. When they're both active, magnesium is removed from the depolarization here. So when we spit out glutamate, and NMDA receptors get activated, we activate kinases, and those are going to phosphorylate AMPA receptors. That's going to do two things to them. It's going to increase their conductance, and it's going to tag them for insertion into the membrane. So now we have an additional number of AMPA receptors, and each of them conducts a greater number of ions. Therefore, we have stronger synapses. We also stimulate CREB. CREB is going to increase the expression of AMPA receptors, so we make more of them. Yeah? This sounds familiar. Is the same thing that's going on with like the olive and learning for the serotonin? Kind of, yeah. It's the opposite. right? Instead of removing AMPA receptors, that's long-term yeah. depression. Here we're inserting them, long-term potentiation. We also see long-term depression in uh, the hippocampus. And that's whenever we have a low rate of stimulation. A high rate of stimulation causes LTP. So when you actually have strong stimulation of neurons, when you're, when you're studying and, and you know, really trying to learn, when you're actually focused on it, then you're going to elicit LTP. What that LTP does is strengthen the synapses of those active neurons, so they're more likely to fire together in the future. So when you're thinking about what does calcium do, that stimulates the next line in that pattern, which is cause mitochondrial permeabilization, kill the cell. The way that you link those bits of information together, help, like fire is hot. We have fire, we have hot. When you touch fire and you burn yourself, those are both active at the same time, and they are then linked together through LTP. So when you think fire, you think, right, that's hot. Just thinking fire is enough to stimulate that hot pattern as well. So we link together bits of information through LTP, and we remove those links through LTP. Um, there's other sources of input that can modulate how excitable our hippocampus is, and thus how likely we are to learn. So there's going to be input from other areas. There's cholinergic input from the septum that's going to cause strong depolarization. That's going to help um, uh, cause you know burst firing in the hippocampus, which will increase the likelihood of having pre and postsynaptic neurons active at the same time. If they're active at the same time, LTP occurs, and they strengthen their synapses. 
There's neuromodulatory input too. Norepinephrine, serotonin, dopamine from different sources. So these are going to be brought in via the fornix. That's a fiber bundle that's both input and output for the hippocampus. So we're going to be dumping neuromodulatory transmitters there. For the most part, these are going to be activating GS coupled receptors, increasing cyclic AMP. And then a couple things can happen. Neurons can be more excitable because of that. That's fine. That's going to be a short-term effect. The long-term effect here, the actual memory of it, is going to be because of stimulation of, for example, protein kinase A. We phosphorylate amber receptors. And we put more of them at the synapse. Nice. We can also stimulate CREB and make a whole bunch more amber receptors. So we have a stable increase in synapse strength. The reason that we think the hippocampus is so fundamental for memory is simply because it is. Patient HM, this guy had epilepsy, uh, severe epilepsy that was originating in the medial temporal lobes. The treatment uh, was to cut out the medial temporal lobes. Since it was originated bilaterally or on both sides, they had to cut out both sides. So his hippocampus was gone. <coughs> both hippocampal complexes were removed. Uh, his epilepsy was controlled, uh, but he had absolutely no memory uh, from then on out. Severe anterograde amnesia. So he worked with the same clinician for decades. Never remembered. Every day was, hi, how you doing? Pleasure to meet you. Um, had no idea who the president was. He was trapped in time. Another example would be Clyde Waring. This guy uh, uh, contracted herpes encephalitis. Here's where they cut out patient HM. This virus targeted the medial temporal lobes, which is where we find the hippocampus. So his hipp hippocampi, gone. Both. Both of them gone. Now he was alive. He only has less than 30 seconds memory. Today, I don't and know if he's still alive. Sometimes it's as little but as But more recent that we could actually videotape it. It's as little as a sentence. I'm going to see your sister, Adele. Her daughter's got married recently oh, I see. in New Zealand. Oh. And so they're having a party. Funny how the ladies acquire a different title when they get married. Do you know who I'm going to see tomorrow? Uh, Buckingham Palace. No, read really the guess. Do you, you don't know. Adele. Oh, I do. Do you know Do you know why I'm going? No. She's having a party at her house tomorrow. It's her birthday. No. Mm -hmm. Do you know why? No. It's to do with her daughter. Oh, I see. Do you what? know why her daughter's having a party? No. Guess. No, I don't. She's just got married. Oh, I see. She just got married, and do you know what country she's got married in? No. In New Zealand. Oh, I see. Yeah. The sentence he is in, he will probably have forgotten the sentence before. You ask him a question uh, and he'll give you an answer, but while he's giving me the answer, he's already forgotten the question. So when you lose your hippocampus, you really just lose uh, your ability to store any real information. So he's talking to you, he can respond, he knows what words mean because these are distant memories that are stored in the cortex. Those are fun. What's lost is his ability to put together information and to really create a sense of now and compare that to the past. That's what the hippocampus is doing for us. <clears throat> Storing information transiently so that we have an idea of where we are and where we were before. When that's lost, well, you lose your ability to store memories and, and, and also it, it seems actually very depressing when he describes it. I've never seen anyone at all. I don't, I've never heard a word until now. I've never had a dream, even day and night the same, blank. Precisely like death. No thoughts at all. Brain has been inactive and day and night exactly the same. No dreams even. Every time he sees Deborah, he believes it's the first time in years. <laughs> no. He's stranded, if you like, on this tiny scrap of time. He has no past that he knows about, and he has no specific idea of the future. All he has is void behind him. It's been like death. I've never seen a human being before, never had a dream or a thought. The brain has been totally inactive, day and night the same, no thoughts at all. As far as I'm concerned, the doctors have been totally incompetent. I've never seen a doctor. 
the whole time. <gasps> oh, look, he's coming. Oh, 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 oh. So that's kind of nice. But, um, <laughs> so he, he they asked him to keep a diary, and his diary entries went, I am now awake. And then he would scratch that out. Now I am completely awake. Scratch that out. Now I am fully and completely awake. Scratch that out. So every moment was like he's just waking up because he has no past. So you should thank your hippocampus for your sense of continuity in the day and your ability to learn nifty stuff like what the hippocampus does. Uh, do we have any questions? <laughs> no. Believe it or not, no. All right, let's review these. All right, let's talk about the emotional circuits in the limbic system then. There's a few structures to go over. Some are going to be more linked with positive emotions, some with negative emotion. We'll see if we can link all these together by the time we're done. The anterior cingulate, I want you to think of as being active during positive emotion. In folks with normal cognitive function, this is the case. It's less active during negative emotions, more active during positive emotions. The cingulate cortex has a bunch of different functions, though. Keep this in mind. Part of it has to do with, uh, with this uh, emotional response, but it also has areas that respond to pain. That probably links together pain and emotion. Part, part of it is active when we're filling our bladder, so it, so it keeps tonic, um, sympathetic activation. Some of it's involved with speaking. There's motor planning. There's a lot going on in the anterior cingulate. So we're going to simplify it and just think of it as being uh, associated with positive emotion. That's good enough. We'll realize that it does a whole lot more stuff. We can always go look that up. But think of it as positive emotion when it's active. When it's inhibited, negative emotion. Here's the activity of the, the anterior cingulate when we're looking at negative images. So uh, people in pain or making angry faces uh, versus neutral images. So just a regular face or you know, a picture of a block, something that shouldn't elicit an emotional response. <clears throat> Healthy controls. Schizophrenics uh, who do not have violent tendencies and schizophrenics with violent tendencies. I want you to notice the difference here when viewing negative imagery. <clears throat> There's an increase in the activation of their anterior cingulate here. So it's inappropriate emotional responses that might lead to those violent tendencies here. So the anterior cingulate, we're thinking positive emotion. When you think of amygdala, it's okay to think of it as negative emotion, but it's probably more accurate to think of it as just emotion. How much emotion should I have? That's based on amygdala activation. Undoubtedly, the amygdala is linked to negative emotion, and we'll see why in just a bit. But it's also active during positive emotion, too, and that's because the amygdala is very complicated. There are several different subnuclei in it. There's excitatory neurons, inhibitory neurons. So when you say the amygdala is active, you have to go a little more specific than that. Is it the inhibitory interneurons? Is it the projection neurons? Because that makes a huge difference. So when you think amygdala, just kind of think emotion in general. Biasing a little more toward <coughs> negative emotion if it has output. But it will be active during positive emotion too. It likely just doesn't create the same output. In that case, it's likely just the inhibitory interneurons that are suppressing output. <coughs> This is linked to a variety of structures. The insular cortex, which is active during pain, is going to be stimulated by the amygdala. So part of that negative output is creating pain there. This links your pain and emotion. Emotion and memory. Well, the, the connections between the amygdala and the hippocampus, those are adjacent to one another. They're both in the inferior, anterior, medial, temporal lobes. There's direct glutamatergic projections from the amygdala to the hippocampus. So when the amygdala is active, the hippocampus is more active. And when the hippocampus is more excitable, that facilitates LTP and the encoding of memory. So those emotional uh, events that occur in your life are easier to remember. Very strongly emotional events, such as wartime, for example, can create... Um, long-lived and, and sort of invasive memories. 
post-traumatic stress disorder, for example, where uh, sensory events like certain sounds that, that were occurring during that event can trigger the emotional response again in the future. And that's because of this link between emotion and memory. Your hippocampus can stimulate the amygdala, the amygdala can stimulate the hippocampus. So when, those, when you hear those sounds that remind you of that event, that can trigger a strong activation of the amygdala, and the amygdala can cause a profound autonomic response where you're going to experience a lot of anxiety as a result. There'll be a change in heart rate, for example, arousal, of course, through the uh, reticular formation there, a stress response via the hypothalamus. So the emotional responses also create a visceral response as well, and that's because of the amygdala's widespread connections. Sure, it's linked up here with memory, but it's also linked downward with the brain stem where it can cause a change in autonomic output and a change in the way that your body is functioning. So there'd be a change in respiration, change in heart rate, for example. You might feel a little sweaty. There's also a link with the association cortices where the magic happens, right? Where we're storing long-term memories, for example, creating perceptions. Undoubtedly, the amygdala is important for more than just emotion because you see it activated during memory tasks as well. Here's a couple different memory tasks recalling autobiographical memories, or just facts. The amygdala is a lot more active during autobiographical memories than when just remembering old facts. The hippocampus, a little different. They're both active, of course, during memory recall, because they're both important in this. Semantic memories cause a little more activation in the hippocampus. So the hippocampus is down here. The amygdala activity is shown up here. First one would be for autobiographical, second one more for semantic memories in that case. We're going to link in with other areas of the uh, emotional circuitry here. The nucleus accumbens is an important regulator of whether we have positive or negative emotion, whether we have action. So this is in the ventral striatum here. We'll get to that in a bit. The reason we think that the amygdala is so uh, strongly linked with negative emotion is because it's more strongly activated by negative emotion. When you look at its activation to different types of voices and faces, fearful versus happy in both of those, you get the strongest excitation when people are viewing a fearful voice from a fearful face. So when those are both together. So they can play different clips and show different audio, uh, show different vision and play different audio there. So the strongest response in the amygdala comes from fearful input. Fear and anger strongly activate the amygdala. But everything else does too. Again, it's just it's linked to emotion. The output of it, though, is certainly strongly linked to negative emotions. When you have damage to the amygdala, it becomes difficult for you to recognize negative emotions. And that's what occurred in, in uh, this lady here, patient SM. Uh, she had bilateral amygdala damage because of just a genetic defect. So she was born without her amygdala. And she couldn't recognize fearful faces when she viewed things that are normally uh, a bit scary to folks, like snakes. Okay? She had no fear. She rated imagery very low uh, in fear responsiveness. She would approach um, um, dangerous individuals on the street and she would get injured and go to the hospital as a result. She didn't recognize that uh, maybe this this uh, gang here shouldn't be approached. She didn't mind handling snakes uh, when presented to her. She was basically fearless. And that sounds nice, but it's actually not. Fear and pain are both very instructive. So when you're missing your amygdala down here, you don't recognize fear. And that's what occurred in this case. Here's a uh, healthy control uh, up here. SM is missing the amygdala on the bottom. You can also cut it out in animals and look at their behavior. So here's two different rats, uh, top and bottom. They're going to come out of a hole here. There's a mechanical cat, and they're going for a little food pellet. One of them has the amygdala intact. The other has it removed. Any idea which is which? <laughs> so this one didn't care. It went and got the food. This mechanical cat was chomping in its face, fearless. This would be terrible in the wild. He wouldn't survive. Uh, this is still rolling. This other rat will eventually peek his head out. It'll make a move. It'll, it'll duck. Uh, you can watch that on your own. <laughs> and hyperactivity of the amygdala is associated with overactive negative emotion. 
In other words, anxiety. So when you look at the uh, activity of the amygdala when viewing different types of imagery here, it doesn't matter what they're looking at. You see a whole lot more activity in these anxiety-prone subjects compared to subjects who are not anxious. So that constant negative output from the amygdala creates that anxiety. That's what it is. When you have a hyperactive amygdala, you have anxiety. So some folks are just going to be born unlucky and have slightly more excitable amygdala. As a result, have a bit more anxiety than others. The last place I want to bring up is, yeah. Uh, so David said amygdala has, really has no effect on positive emotions, just negative? Yeah, they, so patient SM, for example, could still recognize smiley faces uh, just fine, surprised faces, but the, the negative emotions, she wasn't able to as accurately pick. Yeah, and, and that's why we, we tend to think of the amygdala as dealing with negative emotion, but that's not all it does. It's a little more complicated than that. Undoubtedly, that's, if, if you had to pick one thing for it, I think that's pretty safe, because that's largely what you see, a loss of fear loss of uh, anger recognition. The nucleus accumbens is down there in the ventral striatum. So we're dealing with spiny projection neurons, same thing that we had in the dorsal striatum. And there's D1 and D2 again, which is pretty nice. That's going to allow us to have different responses based on whether we have dopaminergic or glutamatergic input to the nucleus accumbens. So there's two types of spiny projection neurons and they have different Projection patterns, the D1 SPNs. Here's essentially your direct pathway for emotion. We're gonna hit the output nuclei of the basal ganglia. Because we're inhibiting them, we're gonna drive activity. So when we have dopaminergic input to the nucleus accumbens, regardless of what causes it, we have an increase in activity. The emotional component seems more uh, involved with the D2 SPNs. So those that have D2 type dopamine receptors that will be inhibited by dopamine. These make GABAergic connections with other emotional circuits, like the anterior cingulate, for example. So when these are active, they inhibit that positive emotion. When you inhibit them with dopamine, we disinhibit. We feel good. How oh, nice. So we're going to have different effects based on what's our input. Dopamine, we'll get an increase in D1 and a decrease in D2 SPN output. So we do stuff and we feel good. With amygdala input, that's glutamate. Glutamate is excitatory to both, so we do stuff, we get away from whatever is causing that fear, but we don't feel good about it. So we have negative emotion because of a negative <coughs> input here. This might be what's, what's creating that negative uh, connection between amygdala and anterior cingulate. This hasn't been worked out very well, though. That's the idea. So here we're looking at the effect of stimulating either D1 or D2 SPNs in the nucleus accumbens when giving different doses of cocaine. One is not quite enough to cause the mouse to think that this is a great spot. Not enough cocaine. This is enough cocaine. So here's control, we're not doing anything. You can see that whenever we bump up the dose of cocaine, the mouse is far more likely to spend time in this part of the chamber where it got its cocaine. It's a great spot. <laughs> they also have a little um, uh, fiber optic cable implanted so they can shine that blue light and turn on either D1 or D2 SPNs. So it's the same thing as last lecture. We get that light sensitive ion channel. So when we flash a blue light, we either turn on our D1 or our D2. So even with that suboptimal dose of cocaine, when you stimulate your D1 receptors, which is what cocaine would do, well, now they prefer that side. Because we've, we've essentially mimicked the effects of dopamine here. On the other hand, if you antagonize the effects of dopamine by stimulating the D2 SPNs, they don't prefer this as much. While they are getting enough cocaine to feel good over there, what we're doing is stimulating those neurons that we're normally inhibiting, and that's creating the negative emotion over here. So the preference is not as strong as you can see. So D1, positive. D2, negative. And that's why dopamine is going to cause positive emotion and amygdala input is most likely going to create negative emotion, but both will drive motor output. Here we can see the different activity in D1 and D2 SPNs when they enter that cocaine chamber. 
So here's the party room, and here's the normal spot. Notice the difference, all right? And, and so we're recording from two different populations. Watch what happens with D1 when they step in. Oh yeah, <laughs> I remember that. Notice that drop in D2. That's because of dopamine input. Dopamine, of course, has different effects. If it's D1, GS couple. D2, GI couple. And so this creates that different, that different output there. All right, so there it is in real time. Now here's another way that we've studied these two populations. This is called a social defeat model. They put this little mouse in with a larger aggressive mouse, have him bully uh, him for a little bit. This is pretty terrible. And then uh, this mouse is going to live right here. Uh, they have these plexiglass dividers here, but they can see and smell each other. So after getting bullied, you have to live right next to this guy and look at him every day. Now, some mice are going to respond uh, by, by essentially exhibiting depression. So they're going to have reduced motor output. When you put them in um, a, a tank of water, they just kind of give up. They don't try to get out of it. Uh, it's sad. But some are resilient. And, and those resilient ones, um, what we see in this case, those that are resilient to that social defeat don't have an increase in the uh, input to their D2 spiny projection neurons. But those who had that defeat, that negative emotion, guess what? Increased excitatory input to their D2 SPNs, creating that negative emotion. Why are they depressed? Their D2 SPNs are far more excitable. There's a little bit of a drop to their D1, sure. But here's where you see the big part of it here. So those that are inhibiting areas like the anterior cingulate, well, now we don't create that positive emotionality anymore. Through that social defeat, So dopamine is going to be a, a, a really important switch here. It's going to turn off the inhibitor for positive emotion. We're going to disinhibit positive emotion with dopamine. Dopamine also regulates whether we do stuff. So dopamine is critical for reward, for, for uh, addiction. It all comes down to dopamine. Any drugs that are going to act on dopamine signaling have the risk of being addictive. And the more directly they manipulate dopamine signaling, the more addictive they are. Cocaine, amphetamine, both of these are going to act directly on dopaminergic signaling. They're going to inhibit reuptake and amphetamine actually reverses it. So you get a lot more dopamine sitting out there. So when you do your cocaine and methamphetamine, you feel great about it. This was a wonderful idea. You have positive emotion and you're stimulating your D1 SPN, so you're more likely to do that motor program again, whatever that entails. <laughs> nicotine is also highly addictive, in case you haven't heard, and that's because of nicotinic acetylcholine receptors on dopamine neurons. So you get a boost of nicotine, and you feel great about it because you're boosting dopamine output from the VTA. Highly addictive substances. Hey, so are opioids. What opioids are going to do is disinhibit dopamine neurons. They're going to act on mu opioid receptors over here and inhibitory interneurons. So we inhibit inhibitory interneurons and thus disinhibit the dopamine neurons. Same thing for alcohol. But we're not acting on metabotropic receptors, so it's a little safer. We're acting on ionotropic receptors, so you don't get as long-lived disinhibition. You have to booze all day for that to occur. I don't recommend that. Cannabinoids could also do the exact same thing. We have cannabinoid receptors on our inhibitory interneurons, so when you inhibit them, you disinhibit dopamine release. And you feel kind of nice. The long-term use, of course, of any of these addictive drugs is going to cause homeostatic downregulation, so when you're not using the drug, you don't feel that positive emotion anymore. Here we can see the change in dopamine receptor in cocaine and meth users compared to healthy controls. This is through, uh, I think, PET imaging. Could be spec basically the same thing. You apply a, a ligand that binds to D2 receptors. It spits out a little uh, high-energy molecule you pick up. The amount of that energy uh, relates to the amount of receptor. You can see a down-regulation of dopamine receptors in both cases here. <coughs> surprise, surprise. When you flood your system with dopamine, your system downregulates dopamine receptors. It's just homeostasis. You can't escape it. One last thing. I promise. <laughs> uh, this is just to tell us uh, the importance of emotion in, in, in memory. 
why do we recognize things? Why do we feel a closeness to people? It has to do with stimulation of these emotional circuits. So when you have damage to your limbic system, more specifically to the emotional circuits of the limbic system, you might lose that familiarity. And so there's, an, uh, there's a really interesting um, um, syndrome called Capgras syndrome. And I think we'll just get some point by listening David to this guy. David was involved in a terrible car accident while driving back to California from Mexico. There was a problem with the car and I landed in the highway with my head first. Like this truck that is so For five weeks, David lay in a coma. Serious injuries led to the loss of his right arm. But to everyone's relief, when he regained consciousness, his mental capacities seemed to be intact. He was articulate, he was intelligent, not obviously psychotic or emotionally disturbed. Uh, he could read a newspaper, everything seemed fine, except he had one profound delusion. He would look at his mother, and he would say, this woman, doctor, she looks exactly like my mother, but in fact, she's not my mother, she's an imposter, she's some other woman pretending to be my mother. The injury to David's brain had brought on a very rare condition called the Capgra delusion. I was cooking dinner, and he probably... So this occurs for people, for, for places, and, and this also occurs with uh, neurodegeneration of limbic structures, like in Alzheimer's disease. You can get this sense that that, that person is an imposter, or, or that's not my tractor outside. It looks just like my tractor, but it's not it. Someone's replaced it. That's because you don't have that emotional response to it anymore, and your familiarity is nothing more than that. The reason you feel familiar with people or things is because of that emotional response. Because you've learned it, you have memories associated with it, you have certain amounts of pleasure or displeasure associated with that as well. And it's hilarious, it really is. Alright, um, I think that uh, I've run far too long, I've taken more time than I deserve. Um, if you have no questions, get out of here, I'll see you next week.